Hello, everyone. Welcome. We'll take a few moments and allow people time to join us. We're so glad you're here. Welcome, welcome. Bienvenidos. Welcome, everyone. We're going to continue waiting. I see people still joining. Welcome, welcome. All right, I think we are going to officially begin. Hello everyone and welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is 2022 Migration Season Wrap Up with the one, the only David Barber, Hawk Mountain's Senior Research Biologist. Welcome, David. Hi everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Jamie Dawson, and I'm the Director of Education at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. And thank you so much for joining us this evening. As you may know, Hawk Mountain is the world's very first refuge for birds of prey. And we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education, locally and globally. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit, and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. To all of our members, thank you so very much for your continued support. We literally could not do what we do without your support. And if you're joining us this evening and you're not a member, well, it's okay, we like you anyway, but we hope you consider becoming a member in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone remains safe and healthy throughout the new year. And we are thrilled to offer our local and global community a variety of free virtual programming. But as always, Hawk Mountain greatly appreciates and depends on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program is being recorded. The video will then be accessible on Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting you to our YouTube channel. And at any point during today's program, viewers may submit questions through the Q&A feature on the Zoom platform. We've designated some time at the end of the program to take questions from the audience. And I always look forward to January where I get to collaborate uh, with the awesome David Barber and hear from him all of the updates and highlights and summaries from Hawk Mountain's 2022 migration season. And dare I add the longest running raptor migration count in the world, that's amazing. And before we get started, I'd like to take a moment and share with the audience David's background experience. David holds a master's of science in zoology and joined Hawk Mountain in 1999. He is responsible for collecting data in the field, managing our natural history databases, including our long-term raptor, bird, and butterfly counts, and for all sanctuary GIS mapping projects. He also conducts stewardship and monitoring programs, helps in conducting the annual count, and trains interns, particularly in wing tagging techniques and the use of mapping software. David is a talented birder by ear and skilled naturalist who can be found out and about working to complete the breeding bird, butterfly, and other annual surveys on the sanctuary. And perhaps just as important, David is an award-winning brewer. Uh, he is our resident beer connoisseur and enjoys working with his hunting dogs, which are beautiful golden retrievers, and being outdoors. So David, thank you again for joining us and sharing with us your expertise. And you are in charge of managing the longest running raptor migration count in the world. What led you down this career path of raptor conservation science? Well, I think, you know, from an early age, I was always interested in nature. I always wanted to be outside. I was not interested in watching TV or anything like that. So. Um, I think when I got to college, my focus turned to birds um, and mostly songbirds. And so for a long time, I studied um, the nesting ecology of songbirds and their behavioral ecology. And then when I had the opportunity to move back to New Jersey and join, or not, well, back to this area and join Hawk Mountain, um, I just applied what I learned in college and what I learned after college um, to raptors and just just fit in seamlessly. Wonderful. That must be why you're so good at birding by ear, all those songbird calls that you exactly. know. <laughs> cool. So would you mind sharing with us uh, one of your personal favorite 
memories from the lookout uh, from last year's count? Yeah, so there was definitely one particular day that was a highlight. Um, it was September 18th. It was not our highest Broadwing day, but it was one of the highest. And we had it a, an hour in the afternoon where we would see this kettle, which is just Broadwing circling up in a thermal um, out over one and two, and they were streaming by. And they did this for an hour. And so by the end of the hour, uh, we counted over 1,900 Broadwings, um, wow. and we there were several counters there. We all turned and looked at each other, and we were just like, we've never seen that at Hawk Mountain before. I mean, this is, you know, probably 70 years worth of Hawk watching experience at Hawk Mountain, and nobody had ever seen that before. And that was just, it was jaw dropping just to see that many birds, and they were close. They were right overhead. I mean, it's just fantastic. So. Amazing. And uh, thank you for sharing that. And I love how when I asked you the question, like you knew the exact date, you're like, yes. it was September 18th. <laughs> um, and for anyone watching who has not been uh, to the lookout during fall migration, or even during like the second half of September for Broadwings, you have to experience it because as, as David is kind of emanating that energy and that all, oh, there's nothing like seeing those birds passing by, let alone 1900 in one hour. So <laughs> Thanks, David, again, for sharing that. And I'm going to turn it over to you. Um, we're sure. looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. No problem. OK, so as, as Jamie alluded to, um, I am one of the counters up at North Lookout. And I'm responsible for the migration count. And I have to say, it's one of the favorite, my favorite times of year. Um, just because I get to spend a lot of times outdoor watching birds. But it's really, you know, when August run turns around and you get that first cold front, um, it, it always gives me goosebumps. Um, just to imagine what the, the season is going to entail. I mean, it's really like Christmas because you, you know, you can think about, you know, what, you know, what are we going to see this year? You know, what are the trends? But in reality, we just don't know. The birds don't read the reports. And so it's really a magical time of year when just anything can happen. So just to give you a bit of an overall summary, this was our 88th year counting up at North Lookout, the longest running watch site in the world. Uh, we had five staff and 17 volunteers helping us count. And our season runs from August 15th through December 15th. Um, and we added a few days after that as, you know, some nice winds picked up. So uh, people wanted to head up and see if they could spot any late season eagles. So over that time, we don't count when it's raining or when we have snow and sleet. So over that time period, somebody was up there 116 days. We spent 1,067 hours on the lookout spotting raptors. We counted 15 species. Um, we missed rough leg this year, which most watch sites didn't get rough legs this year, but we counted a total of 20,347 raptors, a really nice uh, total for the season. But if you've ever been up there, we don't just count raptors, we count everything that migrates through. So, you know, not only raptors, but we counted um, 10 species of butterflies three species of dragonflies and 127 species of birds for a total of almost 68,000 non-raptors. So it keeps us busy. Um, there's always something to see, even when there's not birds migrating, there's always turkey vultures. So it's always a great time to come up to North Lookout. And with any season, I always like to say that there are winners and there are losers. Um, and what I mean by that are the winners are those birds that, you know, we counted 5% or more above their 10 year average. So this year we had two winners, bald eagles and broadwing hawks. And I'll talk a little bit about all these species a little bit later in the, in the talk. Unfortunately, we also had a lot of losers this year. Um, black vultures, turkey vultures, ospreys, northern harriers, northern goshawk, red shoulders, red tails, golden eagles. They were all a little bit below average. Some were a lot below average, um, but there's different reasons for that. And I'll get into that a little bit. 
And then we have those species that were just about average, Sharpies, Coopers, and all the falcons. So like I said, we never know exactly what's, how the season is gonna pan out, um, but it's always a great time to come up and see what, uh, what birds are flying. So as I mentioned before, broadwing hawks are really the, uh, were the big winners this year. We counted um, just over 12,500 birds. And what was really crazy was that uh, we had a five day total where we had over 10,000 birds pass by the lookout. Um, this was a big count. It was 60% above our 10 year average. And um, Frank, it was our ninth highest total ever here at Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. And broadwings are our most abundant, but also our most variable migrant. They really, the bulk of the migration comes through in that third week in September. And it really depends on the winds during that week, whether we have a good flight or a bad flight. And this year we had light winds, sunny skies, strong thermals. Um, so we had an incredible count this year. So broadwing hawks are um, a super flocking migrant. So they come through in large flocks. And often what you see is birds circling up in a thermal. Um, obviously, it's really difficult to count them at this time. Uh, we wait until they come out of the thermal and start streaming. And that's when we start counting the birds as they come by. So if we look at our long-term data, you can see that the counts are variable from year to year. Uh, we had this really crazy count year in 77, which we call, um, we had one day where we were counted over 20,000 broadwings moving through, our miracle day. Um, but otherwise, that's an outlier. But otherwise, we see there's an incredible amount of variation from year to year. Uh, this year was much better than last year. Um, but again, it all depends on what the environmental conditions are during that third week in September. Now, if we look at some of the other watch sites in Pennsylvania, this is um, most of the watch sites that have long-term data. Anything with a blue arrow pointing up is where they had above average counts. Anything with a down arrow that's red is where we, they had below average counts. So you can see across Pennsylvania, most of the sites had above average counts this year. And what was really cool was that most of their big counts were confined across Pennsylvania to two days. It was September 17th, and I think September 16th. So the broad wings were moving through Pennsylvania in a wide swath um, and a lot of birds were being counted and a lot of high counts were being counted. The other big winner uh, for this season were bald eagles. It seems like um, every year I come, I say, you know, it's another great year for bald eagles and it's true. And we counted 591. This was our second highest year ever, second only to last year. Um, we are 21% above average. Our high count of 38 on September 23rd was um, probably the second highlight of the season for me. We actually, there was a counter who came up and he said, and it was late in the day and he's like, we were, I think we were up to 16 bald eagles by then. And he's like, oh, I, you know, I just, I just wanna, I need to get to 17. I told my wife, I wasn't gonna leave until we had 17 bald eagles. And lo and behold, in the next hour, we had 17 bald eagles. And so it was, it was a remarkable flight, a very late day after four o'clock flight of bald eagles. Um, yeah, it was just, um, it was crazy the number of bald eagles that were moving through um, late in the day. And the bald eagles are really a success story in Pennsylvania. Um, they banned DDT in 1972, um, which caused eggshell thinning and decreased uh, hatching rates in bald eagles. But once that was banned, we saw bald eagle populations take off. And so what we're seeing is at Hawk Mountain, we're setting a new bald eagle record um, almost every other year. Um, this year, again, was a little lower than last year, but again, a remarkable success story. And if you look at across Pennsylvania, a lot of the watch sites were above average this year as well. And this is a trend that we're seeing um, not only in Pennsylvania, but kind of watch sites 
across the United States. We can see there's a couple sites that were low. Um, I know one of those sites, it was just because um, the amount of hours that they spent was, was low. So that could be potentially the reason for um, that, that, uh, that low season there. But while we have winners, um, we also have some losers. I mean, I don't wanna call them losers because really all the Raptors are winners, aren't they? Um, but we did have some birds that were below average. Um, actually, we had a lot of birds that were below average. So Northern Harriers are a species that um, are a grassland nesting species and inhabit native grasslands. Um, we counted 122 this year, which was 16% below average. Um, so really, when I'm talking about, you know, what the count was this year, it was low, it was high. It's really only one year's worth of data. So that doesn't really tell us a whole lot. It's really looking at the long-term trends that allows us to look at uh, trends in populations, whether species are increasing or decreasing. Um, and unfortunately for, for Northern Harriers, they tend to look, they look like our numbers are decreasing. Um, if you say from the mid eighties or so through 2022, we're seeing about a 3% decline per year in the counts of Northern Harriers. Now, if we look across Pennsylvania, we also see that a lot of the watch sites are seeing declines or had below average counts this year. Um, there are the two um, arrows that are horizontal that are yellow. Those are, spe those are counts where they had average counts this year. Um, and so the question is, you know, is this this year abnormal? It didn't appear to be um, according to looking at our long-term trends. Um, and, and the other question is why would these, why is this species decreasing? Well, as I mentioned, Northern Harriers are grassland nesting species and that's a habitat that has been in decline in recent years. And the other question is, you know, what we're seeing in Pennsylvania, is that a trend kind of throughout their range or is it anomaly? And if we look at some of the long-term, well, not long-term, but the last 10 years worth of data, these are um, counts uh, across the east and those counts that have downward arrows are where the counts have been declining in the last 10 years. The blue dots are where counts are average and any green dots uh, are where the counts are actually increasing. So this is data from the Raptor Population Index where they have taken watch site data from across the United States and Mexico and looked at our, or analyzed their population trends to see what the trends of different species are. So you can see in the East, probably about over 50% of the watch sites are seeing a decline in Northern Harriers. So we're not alone in Pennsylvania in seeing declining counts. Um, one of the other uh, species that had below average counts this year were osprey. Um, I, you know, when I first started here at Hawk Mountain, September, you really, well, at late September, when you had strong northwest winds that would set up these really nice uh, deflective winds off the north slope, and you would just know that you would see this parade of osprey, just an osprey, one after another coming through. Um, and I haven't seen that in probably 10 years. You know, you kept thinking that this is gonna be the day. The conditions are perfect. We're gonna see a raptor per, or an osprey parade today. Um, it just never seemed to materialize. And this year was, was much of the same. We had uh, the counts were 33% below average. And if we look at our, our long-term data, it looks a lot like the Northern Harrier in that, you know, starting in the mid eighties through now, uh, we're seeing a, about a 3% decline per year in the number of ospreys that we're seeing. Um, and it's accelerated in the last 10 years. We've actually seen a 6% decline each year um, in the number of ospreys that we're counting. Across Pennsylvania, we're seeing, you know, all the watch sites are seeing the same trend, um, decreasing or below average counts this year. And if we look at those watch sites, uh, throughout the east, 
you know, again, it's probably, you know, over 50% of the watch sites are seeing below average counts or seeing declining trends. Um, the one thing we're seeing is that a lot of the, the watch sites along the coast um, seem to be doing okay, as well as a couple of the watch sites up in the Great Lakes. So the question is, you know, what are, why are Osprey numbers declining? And well, one of the things that I first showed you is that bald eagle numbers are increasing. So some researchers suggest that the reason for the decline in Osprey is because in these inland uh, waterways where Osprey like to nest, they're being outcompeted um, by bald eagles as bald eagle populations are increasing. And it's really the populations of osprey along the coast where they tend to nest in groups or colonies um, that they may be able to defend um, or uh, against uh, bald eagles moving into those territories. So that may be why we're seeing increases or stable populations along the coast as opposed to those populations inland. Now, just because a species um, shows a, a downward trend one year or below average count doesn't necessarily mean that the population is decreasing. Red-tailed hawks are one of our most abundant species um, during migration. The top three are broadwing hawks, sharp-shinned hawks, and red-tails. Um, this year, we saw a 20% below average count um, just over 1,100 red tails moving through. And, you know, if we look at our, you know, I so probably sound like a broken record. If we look at our long-term data, um, we're seeing declining trends, you know, starting this time, starting about in the early 80s um, and going through the two, 2020s. So you would expect that when you, maybe there is something with the population, why is the population declining? I mean, if it is declining, but the really important thing is you don't take the data kind of at face value. You in explore other types of data that are out there. So with red-tailed hawks, we can look at Christmas, well, with all the species, we can look at Christmas bird count data, which are a count that's centered around Christmas time, where people go out and count, try and count all the birds within a, I think it's a 10 mile radius circle. Uh, it's long-term data that's been collected for years. And if we look at some of the Christmas count data for red-tailed hawks, we discover that in the Northeast um, and in Southern Canada, those numbers are actually increasing. So while we're seeing declining trends at Hawk Mountain and kind of throughout Eastern North America, if we look at Christmas bird count data, red-tailed hawks are increasing. So Due to global climate change, red-tailed hawks aren't migrating as far as they used to, or they're not migrating at all. So if you're a migratory species, migration is really the most energetically expensive part of the year for you. So if you don't have to migrate, why bother? You know, if there's food abundant throughout the winter, why bother migrating? You might as well stay where you are. So for red-tailed hawks, um, looking at different types of data allow us to look at, uh, explore the population trends that we're seeing at Hawk Mountain and realizing that it's not really necessarily a population decline, it's just a shift in migratory behavior. So unfortunately there are, as I mentioned earlier, there were quite a, flu a lot of um, migration losers this year, species that had counts um, more than 5% below their 10-year average. And probably the biggest one was northern goshawks. Uh, we only recounted four this year. Um, this is a, pop, a species that really has been, their numbers have been in a free fall, um, probably due to um, habitat loss. Uh, we know that they're not short stopping or not migrating as far as they used to because Christmas bird count data shows kind of a stable trend. Um, so that's a species to look out for. It was a species that was just listed as endangered in Pennsylvania this year, uh, with I think only one uh, confirmed nest in Pennsylvania this year. Black vultures were also on the low side this year. This is a species actually that has been declining in the last 10 years or so. 
Um, its population has been increasing and expanding northward, um, but in a, in a lot of their range, they're not migratory. So we may be seeing a shift in migration behavior. So birds aren't necessarily migrating south. Turkey vultures were a little bit below average, um, but again, overall, one year's worth of data doesn't mean a whole lot. You really have to look at the long-term trends and uh, long-term trends for both species of vultures. The, uh, both species are doing very well, as well as red-shouldered hawks. Well, red-shoulders are probably the, the migrate, their counts are uh, fairly steady and stable, um, even though we did see a 12% decline in their 10%, uh, 12% below average counts this year. And golden eagles were um, low as well. Now, golden eagles was an interesting case because we all kind of felt that the migration was a little late this year. Um, you know, we did have a few days where somebody went up after December 15th because there were really nice winds um, and they did record golden eagles moving through. So um, migration may have been a little bit late this year. We also may have seen a little bit of shift in the migration. I know that Allegheny Front, which is a far Western watch site in Pennsylvania, they had record counts of golden eagles this year. Um, so if you looked at kind of the overall number of golden eagles moving through the Pennsylvania this year, um, it was not below average at all. It was um, right on average. So we get to those species that had kind of average counts this year. You know, sharp chin hawks, if you look at the numbers, 1% um, below the 10 year average, which is probably not significant at all. Again, this is our most, our second most abundant migrant with uh, this year we counted uh, 3,700, uh, 3,574 Sharpies. Um, so you might think that, well, there are average count this year, then their, their population is doing just fine. But again, one year's worth of counting doesn't necessarily mean a whole lot is looking at the long-term data. And if we look at the numbers of sharp shins, um, we can see that those numbers are declining kind of starting in early 80s, mid 80s, um, down into the 2020s. So um, in this case, this is a species that is fairly abundant. Um, we don't really know what is causing these low population numbers. Um, I think if we look at uh, watch sites across the east, we're seeing the same sort of trends. You know, about 50% of the watch sites or more than 50% um, are seeing declines in the number of birds that they're counting each year. We don't see uh, increases in Christmas bird counts. Um, so what the cause of these low numbers are, we're not really sure. It's something that um, just needs to be addressed and looked into a little bit further. We know that sharp shins are feed on small birds. Um, in a publication that came out about three years ago from Cornell, um, they estimated that uh, about 3 billion birds have been lost in the United States um, since the early 70s. So that is a tremendous amount of birds. Whether that has any influence on the population of sharp and hawks is unknown. Uh, we also know that they're a forest nesting species, a boreal forest nesting species, and that's a type of habitat um, that is under threat. So it could be an influence of lower food abundance. It could be an influence of habitat change or habitat loss. Um, we just don't know. And it's, and it's something to keep on our radar um, to try and understand why um, these numbers are declining. Because it was really when the Raptor Population Index was published two years ago, three years ago, uh, when they did the 2019 analysis. Um, it was a real shock for a lot of hawk watchers um, to see declines this widespread in Eastern North America. But as I mentioned, we don't just count raptors at Hawk Mountain, we count everything. Um, so I just wanna highlight some of the non-raptors that we counted this year. This was, these were our top fives. Um, Canada geese, just over 14,000 Canada geese. Um, we did have 
I think our high day was something like, I don't know, 3,700 birds moving through in, uh, in a day. Um, it was, we had a really nice flight, waterfowl flight, uh, I think it was the first week in December, um, where we had lots of Canada geese. We had lots of snow geese, which were our second most abundant migrant. Um, our high day for Canada's was something, or for snow geese was like 3,800. Uh, blue jays, which a lot of people don't think of as blue jays as migratory. It was our third most abundant migrant. And the high day was just over a thousand birds moving through. I mean, what's really interesting is that you, hear, you see blue jays all the time early in the season. And then all of a sudden you see these flocks of migrants and we know they're migrants because they're absolutely silent. They're not calling. The, the local birds call, but birds on migration are silent. And so we are just seeing flocks of blue jays up to like 120, 200 birds moving through at a time. Common grackles were our fourth most abundant migrant, um, just over 5,000. Our high day was something like 2,500 birds. Um, and most of those birds were in a single flock, um, which was really cool. And then our fifth most abundant migrant, which is always in the top five, were cedar waxwings, which starting in late August, you can often see flocks of cedar waxwings moving through past the lookout, um, often stopping and eating the, the berries on the edge of the lookout. Um, so um, it's always good to see nice flocks of cedar waxwings. Uh, one of the highlights this fall for non-raptors were the winter finches. These are species that are what we call eruptive migrants, and they often come south when their cone crops, which they rely on in the wintertime, um, crash. So this year we had a nice flight of birds, not nearly as good as I think it was 2020 when we had record numbers of winter finches, but we did see lots of evening grosbeaks and lots of red crossbills, a few white wing crossbills. Pine siskins were moving through early in the season, starting, I, I believe, in mid-September. Um, and we finished this, the season with a couple of common red poles um, that flew over the lookout as well. And I don't want to forget, purple finches also had a really nice flight as well. A couple of the other species of note, um, we had uh, two dick sissels this year on the lookout. Um, this was the first records of Dick Sissel on North Lookout. Um, we don't know, I mean, I don't believe I've ever heard them, but they have a really distinctive burry call, like that sort of call. Um, so uh, that was really cool. We had two of those. Uh, we had a, three Sandhill cranes in December soaring high over Lookout. It was uh, another one of my highlights of the season. Um, simply because I had never seen sandhill cranes in Pennsylvania before, so I can check that off my list. Uh, Red-eyed vireos, a very common, probably the second most common nesting bird on the sanctuary, um, a species that you can hear in the dead of summer calling, or singing rather, um, and a fairly common migrant as well. We had a day with over 118 red-eyed vireos move through in the morning. Um, for those of you who don't have never been up to North Lookout early in the morning in late August, early September, it is fantastic for migrating songbirds. They move through, migra most songbirds migrate at night. And once the sun rises, they kind of go into the forest and then kind of move through the forest, kind of filtering in and looking for food and kind of bulking up, feeding, and then taking off and the next evening for their flight. So, um, so we had one day with 118 red-eyed vireos, which is um, by far the largest flight we've ever had for red-eyed vireos. And we didn't have a great songbird flight as far as warbler goes. We had an incredible variety of warblers, um, but no really big days like we have had in the past, um, but very, some very good diversity days. And finally, common nighthawks. Um, we had, I believe it was 272 nighthawks recorded this year, um, but the really remarkable day was um, another one of my highlights. We had 170 common nighthawks in one day, 
moving through in like flocks of 20 to 30 um, in the morning and then late in the evening as they were moving through. And I really didn't, as, much, as long as I spent on the lookout uh, at six o'clock, I really didn't want to come down because I was looking forward to more flocks of nighthawks moving through. So those are some of the highlights of our non-raptors. And as I mentioned earlier, I mean, it's, it's the, the migration at North Lookout is really like Christmas. I mean, we don't know what each day is gonna pretend. Uh, we can look at bird cast, we can look at weather, try and figure out the best winds, um, but you just never know what the day is gonna, un how the day is gonna unfold. So at North Lookout, we really rely on kind of the best optics that we have, um, that we use to really spot birds at a distance, we can tell differences in plumage and coloration. And so for the last few years, we've really been relying on Swarovski binoculars, one of the high-end binoculars. Um, and this year we purchased some Swarovski NL Pures. Um, this is a, a, a binocular that just came out two years ago. I mean, and I have to say, I've been hawk watching at North Lookout for, 23 years, and these are the most amazing binoculars you have ever seen. Now uh, we purchased some eight by 42s and 10 by 42s, and we're selling them right now. Um, they're lightly used. I would say the eight by 42s are hardly used at all. And I can't tell you what the price is, but right now they're $500 off. And if you're interested, um, please contact MT, our bookstore manager, um, the information is on your screen. Um, and along with purchase of these binoculars, you also get a free day in the pit um, with the counter of your choice. So you can see how, um, how it's done, how we, we uh, ID these hawks, how we ID the songbirds, et cetera. Um, and it's really, if you purchase those, um, we'll contact you and we'll figure out the best day um, given the conditions and the time of year where you can see the most number of raptors or the most number of songbirds. So with that, um, I just wanna say thanks to everybody who helped out on the count this year. Uh, we have an amazing staff. We have some amazing volunteers who have been counting longer than I've been here. Um, we also have a lot of really amazing trainees, both conservation science and education trainees as well as some data volunteers who, who crunch the numbers when we're done. Um, and I also wanna highlight, we also had a high school intern this year um, from uh, the Reading area um, who um, was a big help and was uh, very enthusiastic in learning how to ID Hawks and how to interact with the public um, and hopefully make a difference um, um, with these visitors. So with that, I will be happy to, to take any questions. Thank you, David, that was amazing. And I wanna know, can other Hawk Mountain staff purchase those binoculars and have a day in the pit with their counter of choice? <laughs> Anytime, I'm gonna, Jamie. I'm gonna contact MT. All right, we have a lot of questions coming in and just right from the very beginning of your presentation, David, the questions were pouring in. So our first question is asking, if you can explain how you count the birds for migration, our scientific protocol. Sure, so these birds are, as they follow the ridge, they're moving in a direction kind of uh, from the northeast towards the southwest. And we have this imaginary line that runs um, kind of east to west. And so the birds, in order for us to count them, have to come from in front of us and pass by on either side. So they're moving in a generally southerly direction. Um, and we just you know, as birds go through, we count them one at a time. It's really only, the only species that migrate in flocks are broadwings and both species of vultures. So otherwise it's fairly easy to tell if a bird has migratory behavior. And it's only those birds that show that behavior that we're counting. Thank you, David. Okay, the next question, um, is there a difference in the count between north and south lookouts? That's a great question. So. Um, North Lookout is our official watch site. So that is the, we collect the data at North Lookout. That's the data we're analyzing for long-term trends. Um, South Lookout data is 
We use South Lookout as a training tool for trainees, how to conduct a count, but also to interact with the public more. Thank you. And another question, is there a best time of day that you would recommend for the migrants in fall? So it, it all depends on the season. So during broadwing season, most of those birds are using thermals to migrate, rising hot air. So thermals start forming about nine or 10 o'clock. And that's where we're seeing a lot of broadwings and the thermals. And then midday, they can get so high that they're difficult to see. And then as the thermals die down three, four o'clock, we tend to see more. So during September, mid-morning and late afternoon are probably when we're seeing the most birds. Um, but other times of the year is when birds are using slope soaring, when winds, northwest winds hit up against the ridge and are forced up and birds are gliding on those winds. Birds can be flying before sunrise and till sunset. So it really depends on the time of year, but you know, mid-September to mid-October is when we have our best flights. So that's the best time of year. Thank you, David. Um, now this uh, other question is about the bald eagles. When you were talking about the bald eagles and sharing the slides, the question is, where were the bald eagles coming from and where were they headed? So it's really interesting at Hawk Mountain. Um, we see two peaks in bald eagle numbers, um, an early peak in late August, early September, and a peak later in November. Um, birds are coming from north of us. Um, and the birds that are flying through in late August, early September, are birds that spent the summer up here but did not breed, and they're migrating to Florida to breed in the wintertime. And then the peak that we see later in the year are birds that did breed here in the summertime and are just migrating to Florida to overwinter or spend the winter. So in general, the birds are coming from north of us. It's really difficult unless you have satellite trackers on these birds to tell exactly where they're coming from. Um, so in general, north of us, and then it probably varies how far south they're moving each year. Right. We're just gonna have to put GPS uh, trackers on every single- Everything. <laughs> um, wonderful. So the next question um, is, is perhaps maybe one that I could answer. It's about the uh, accessing the recording of this webinar that you are watching right now. So yes, it you can access the recording. It's going to be put on our YouTube channel, Hawk Mountain's YouTube channel, it's it's free. And there's also a link on our website that can directly connect you to our YouTube channel. And I believe that we also um, email everyone who registered through Ticket Leap uh, for this webinar. I believe we also email out um, probably through Ticket Leap, the link to the YouTube um, video that will be posted. And it doesn't happen instantaneously, but it will be up um, sooner than later, for sure. Um, so let's see, I think we have another question coming in. Uh, so David, the question is, are the spring counts comparable to the fall counts? Well, you can compare them, but there's not much of a comparison. Um, we average about 18,000 birds in the fall and probably a thousand birds in the spring. Um, so there's, there's a couple of reasons why. One is we start our count a little late in the spring. It's, the spring count is conducted by trainees and they arrive mid-March and start counting April 1st. So we're missing a little bit of the migration, of the early migration, but also the birds in the spring are moving generally in a broad front from south to north and the ridge doesn't concentrate them. If we had winds that were more conducive, they're tend to be out of the south, so they don't create a lot of uplift along the ridge. Um, we might get a larger concentration. Um, so um, the count in the spring, while it, it's, it's nice to see them, we don't see a lot of them. And it's really, I don't, I'll, I'll give a plug to the best watch site in the Northeast for spring. And it's a place called Derby Hill on Lake Ontario, um, north of Syracuse. And what happens is birds are migrating north, they hit the edge of the lake and don't wanna fly across. So they fly around the edge of the lake and that's where the watch site is. 
Um, it's where we take the trainees every spring before they start counting um, so they can see lots of birds. Wonderful. All right, some more questions. Um, David, are we beginning to see raptor species at Hawk Mountain that have not been common to this area in the past? No, um, uh, we haven't, we, we, there are several species of Western uh, my, uh, raptors that we see occasionally, but we ha really haven't seen an increase in the numbers of, the, of those birds. Um, so we really haven't seen an, in, an increase in any unusual sightings of raptors. All righty. Um, so this next question is about the trackers. Mm -hmm. uh, so do the trackers impede a hawk's flight or is it possible it could get caught on something and injure the bird? No, it doesn't. We, you know, this is a technology that's been used a long time um, has, and has been tested. Um, so typically the trackers that we put on are um, used with a backpack style harness. So just like a kid wears a backpack, um, they have, it has Teflon ribbon that runs across the keel or the breast and then attaches underneath the wings. Um, and those, that Teflon ribbon is very, um, non-abrasive. So, and it's, after the bird gets a unit put on, usually one of the first things they do is preen in the feathers. And so you really don't see the harness at all. So it's not really, there's not really a chance of them getting caught on something and, and injuring themselves. And we, when we first part, started putting trackers on, we put a tracker on and put the bird in an enclosure. Um, just to monitor its behavior, and it didn't really, it didn't really affect their behavior at all. And they're so light, right? Is it? Yes, the, we have to kind of the weight of the harness and the tracker itself has to be less than three percent of the bird's body weight. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so the next question is, where are all of the other watch sites in Pennsylvania? So there are. In the fall, there's 15 watch sites and they're spread um, anywhere from, there's several along the Kittatinny Ridge, um, a couple east of us and some west of us. So there's a good watch site in Wagner's Gap near Carlisle. Um, another good watch site is Allegheny Front in Western PA. Um, there are a couple watch sites down near Philadelphia in Southeastern PA. Um, those are the major ones, um, but if you go to a website called hawkcount.org, you can click on a state and um, it will pop up where the watch sites are, the active watch sites are in that state. And they do vary a little bit from spring to fall, but um, you can check out which season is active and which sites are active. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and what advice do you have to people or viewers in the audience uh, who may be interested in getting more involved at, in the count or just improving their hawk watching? So I would just say that the more birds you watch, um, the more time you spend at a watch site, the more information and the better hawk watcher you will be. So spend a lot of time at North Lookout if that's your local watch site. Um, sit by the pit where the counters are. Don't be afraid to ask questions. We're always happy to answer questions. Um, and that's how you really learn, you know, a bird comes by, the hawk counter may call it out and, you know, feel free to say, well, why did you, what made you say it was a sharp chin hawk, you know, and then we can point out what are the, uh, the tips that we use, the flight characteristics, the plumage um, that would lead us to the, calling the bird what it is. And really it's um, time spent on the lookout and watching birds. That's how you learn and um, surrounding yourself with good hawk watchers. Yes, and Hawk Mountain is the place to do that for sure. Absolutely. All right, we did have one more question come in uh, and you were kind of alluding to this earlier in the presentation, David, about how climate change could be um, impacting uh, migration shifts. Mm -hmm. So the question is, could the migration be changing because it's staying warm longer and the birds don't have to migrate? Uh, the water is open, no ice, no snow. And is there any evidence that turning lights off in our big Eastern cities is helping? There's a lot of, lot of questions in there. Um, yeah, we certainly, 
Yeah, we certainly do see a shift in migration behavior. Um, red tails was a perfect example. Yeah. Um, but yeah, the as I mentioned earlier, migration is a very stressful time of year. Um, if and we do see a lot of bald eagles hanging around later, um, and maybe all season. So they, if they do have access to food, you know the water is open year round. Um, then you may see uh, bald eagles hang around longer. Um, we analyzed our data. Uh, here at Hawk Mountain, looking at the, the phenology of migration, you know, when peaks are, when birds start moving through. And what we discovered is that the birds are moving in the fall about a day later every decade. So mm -hmm. it's not a huge jump, um, but over time, you will see some shifts in when birds start migrating. Um, and in the spring, conversely, we find that some other literature suggests that, again, they're arriving about a day earlier every, every decade. So the important thing is that, you know, the, the local prey base that these birds may be relying on may not be changing at the same speed that the birds are migrating at. So you, birds may end up on the breeding grounds when Hopefully, you know, when they, they try to time their breeding to the, the peak food availability is when chicks are in the nest. And so if those are not in sync, um, you may see a decline in, in uh, nesting success. Oh, so. so many variables to consider. And, and then the, the last question was whether light has any effect um, on birds. Um, certainly not for raptors, because most raptors are migrating during the day. Um, but we do see that, you know, a lot of birds um, with the night, uh, bright night sky um, often get um, confused during migration and some um, coll have collisions with buildings or cell towers with those lights. So we do see that there is an impact of a uh, bright night sky on songbirds anyway. Thank you. And David, the questions keep coming in and they're all good. So here's another one. Sure. Um, could you further explain how you know if a bird is migratory or a resident? Uh, sure. Bald eagles or black vultures, for example, sometimes it's hard to tell. Right, it, and it is, I agree, it's hard to tell. So we're looking at migratory behavior. Um, so birds have to have kind of a directed flight. Um, they're kind of flying with a purpose, you could say. So um, black vultures, and turkey vultures, even though we see them often at North Lookout, most of the time we're not counting them. They tend to migrate a little later in the season, starting in October. And when birds are migrating, they often have different behavior. They're often in uh, flocks. Um, they tend to get up higher. And once they hit kind of a thermal and they're coming out of thermal, they really glide through on straight wings um, they're not rocking a lot like turkey vultures normally do. For bald eagles, again, we're, we have to follow a consistent protocol. So if birds are coming from north of us and passing by on either side, we count them. Um, but luckily, we can age bald eagles up to about five years. So if we see a third year uh, bald eagle go by and then 15 minutes later, a third year bald eagle comes from behind us and goes up ridge, um, then we'll subtract that from the count. Um, but we have to follow a consistent protocol. So we keep our um, protocols, you know, we've done it the same way for, for so many years, we can't change our protocols now. Right, that's so important. Um, well, thank you, David, so much. Such a wealth mm -hmm. of information. I always learn something from you and the times that I've been lucky enough to get out to North Lookout in the fall and you've been the counter. Um, I've always learned something. It's fantastic. Um, so thank you again, David. And I want to thank our audience. Thank you for joining us. And thank you for caring about raptors and wanting to know what's going on with our count. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you on the mountain soon. Even though it's January, heading into February soon, we still have tons of stuff going on. Um, and before I share um, some of our upcoming programs, I also just want to let everyone know that um, 
Hawk Mountain has an IDEA fund, an IDEA standing for inclusion, diversity, equity, and accessibility. And it's um, that fund is available to remove any uh, uh, financial obstacles that, uh, that could be preventing people uh, from visiting Hawk Mountain. So if you're interested to learn more about that, please contact myself or perhaps um, the bookstore. Um, so upcoming programs we have, we have our Wilderness First Responder Recertification course this weekend. <laughs> There's still just one or two spots available if you want to do that. Um, also this weekend, the 21st, is Irma's birthday celebration. And Irma, of course, was our first gatekeeper, very important uh, to Hawk Mountain history. So you can bring a birthday card to Irma this weekend and receive a discount on trail passes and select merchandise on the 21st. January 25th, we have our first homeschool happenings of the year, animal adaptations. Uh, next week, uh, next Thursday, the 26th, we have our next stay at home speaker series, which is migrating hawks at Cerro Ancon from Panama. Uh, then January 29th, we have yoga on the mountain. And then in February, our winter artisan series begins. And we collaborate with many local artists and they come in and they teach um, a wonderful art workshop and it's a great way to get get a new skill and also support raptor conservation at the same time. So thank you again so much for joining us and we hope to see you on the mountain soon. Take care and bye for now. Bye everybody.